Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dear friends, dear co-workers. Thank you for joining us for the Cancer Solar Festival webinar. My name is Alexander and I welcome you on behalf of the 2025 Initiatives Coordination Group. Today is the last day of the distribution of the full moon impulse with sun being in sign of cancer, sign of anchoring the high spiritual energies of the higher interludes. And this year it's also time of anchoring the impulse of the festival week of the new group of world service in December 2019. So from now in, in a way we start the normal life living as spiritual beings having adventurous experience in this earth. And today we invite us to reflect on a topic of etheric living, how we recognize ourselves and everything around us as etheric presence, living together in a subtle commons. Our guest today is David Spangler. And uh, David would lead us in the meditation and will share his vision of what is the etheric living and how we can all live in a subtle commons, recognizing the etheric nature of the universe. I'm very grateful to David joining us today. Welcome, David. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's, uh, I feel honored that you are having me give this talk in celebration of this solar festival with all of you. And let's begin with a, a short meditation together. This, this is a meditation that I often use when uh, starting uh, something like this, starting a lecture or starting a project, or often just starting the day. So I'd like you to begin by just looking around you and being aware of the physical place where you are being aware of whatever is within that space with you. With this awareness, we offer blessing to the space in which we are, to the place around us. We offer appreciation for the way in which its energy and its life holds us. We offer appreciation and blessing for the many connections that this place may hold for us. connecting us to the larger world beyond. And so we ask for blessing for the place where we are. Then we ask blessing for ourselves 
we appreciate our unique presence in this place. We appreciate the particular gifts of consciousness, of energy, of spirit, of form and body that we can bring to the world. No one else can bring these particular gifts in this particular way. It is our contribution to the whole of life. And so we bless and we appreciate ourselves Then we bless the activity that we are engaging upon this time together. And we bless each other. We bless this field that unites us in this moment through this medium of telecommunication. We bless what each of us brings to our gathering and to the world as a whole. We complement each other. We each bring what the others cannot, and we receive from others what we could not bring. And so we offer our blessings and our appreciation to each other and to this activity of gathering that has drawn us together. Finally, we offer our appreciation and blessings to the life of the world, to the planetary life that enfolds us, that supports us. That gives us what we need from itself and looks to us to give what it needs in return. And so we offer our appreciation and blessings for the great field of planetary life in which we move and have our being. Thank you. I want, <clears throat> I want to begin this morning with <clears throat> a story. And this story is, is about uh, what I mean by the commons. A couple of years ago, I was sitting here at my desk and, and writing, and I felt a presence come into the room. 
when I put my attention towards this presence, I realized that it was a, a nature being that I had encountered uh, previously at other times. It seemed to me that this being lived in in our neighborhood, in in our backyard, and I I know that that in fact uh, its its domain was much larger than that, but it had this sense of familiarity and a sense of um, caring for the particular area here where I live. And we've had a conversation in the past, as I said, but it's been rare for this being to take the initiative and present itself to me uh, without, uh, uh, let's say by surprise, without my going to it first. So I'm sitting here and this being enters and is standing near the near my computer desk and it says i want to show you something and i said i i would be grateful so all at once it was like it it, it wrapped itself around my consciousness it held me in its field, and it was as if I was looking through its eyes. And I found myself standing in in our backyard. Uh, we live in a in a rather traditional American suburban neighborhood. There's lots of houses around, but also lots of trees and bushes, and and there's a lake nearby, and, and we're not far from uh, various mountain ranges here in the Pacific Northwest. So it's an area that's very uh, lively in terms of nature energies. And I've in the past have gone out and stood on our back porch and just tuned in to the, to the flow of, of life and energy in in our backyard observing uh, nature spirits working with the the trees and the bushes and so on but this was very different seeing through this being's eyes i found myself uh, uh, deepening into a an, a place an inner place that was uh profoundly alive it wasn't a place of of forms. There wasn't anything that I was seeing in that sense. It wasn't like uh, seeing into uh, some inner realm, but it was being in, enfolded in a presence. And then I felt all this other life in my, in my area, specifically the life in my trees and bushes in the in our backyard, but extending outward to the the deva that overlights the, the lake nearby and 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 beyond still to the mountain ranges. But what was different about this experience was the intensity of of life. And I experienced this flow of vivifying energy and and presence that was moving through all the, the beings that made up this inner ecology and indeed moving to me and through me since, since I'm also part of the ecology of this area. And I realized that uh, unlike other things that I've experienced in the subtle realms, this was this was simply uh, an experience of the exchange of living energy, in which each being was offering what it what it had to offer, and receiving what it could receive from others around it, and 
each being was acting as a resource for all the others. And I thought, um, this, this reminds me of the human phenomenon of the commons. Now, uh, many of you will undoubtedly be aware of the commons in, in history, and for that matter, in many places today. It was a, a common thing in New England where I lived for a while that every village had its open space that wasn't owned by anybody. But everybody in the village shared in the resource of that space. It was a place to where uh, animals could be uh, put out for pasture, where uh, a community garden could grow and things like that. But nobody owned it. Everybody, however, was responsible for it and everybody was benefited by it. So it was a resource shared in common. And that's what I was experiencing that this nature being was showing me, was this community of sharing of life in which all the participants were in effect resources of life and, and energy for all the other participants. It wasn't like uh, energy was flowing in, in any kind of hierarchical manner. It wasn't like uh, energy flowing down from uh, the, some one or more of the great devas that overlight the mountains near here. I, I've felt that kind of energy and I'm familiar with it, at least up to a point. But this was different because uh, it was a rising out of the love and the, the connection that all these various beings held for each other, which allowed this energy of life to flow. And my friend, this nature spirit, the one who was giving me this experience, uh, said, uh, this is our commons. And, and, and all life is part of it. Now, one of the characteristics of, of this experience was this uh, flow of life that really was not being directed towards any specific being. Unlike, say, a, a flow of energy that might come from uh, the, the deva over lighting the lake nearby that can be picked up and used by various elemental and nature forces here in the area. This was different. And my way of naming or discussing this difference is that it was an expression of of Gaia's metabolism. So for me, Gaia, the my term for the world soul, is a living being. The, our planet is a living organism. And so it, it stands to reason that it has its own internal metabolic processes. Uh, this, this is using, I know, by, um, a physical biological metaphor to talk about a, something that is not physical or transphysical. But I think the analogy fits. And so what I was feeling in this experience of this subtle commons was that this energy, the flow of this life was not dedicated to any particular entity but was rather the metabolic flow of life, much like the, the, the flowing of blood through our veins and arteries that carried uh, nurturing forces to the whole body of the planet, to all the beings that make up the planet, whether, whether physical or non-physical, whether elemental or devic, what, whatever they are, if they are, 
incarnating or engaged with the earth as a physical entity, then they're being nurtured by this particular flow of energy. And, and it's a flow of energy that was arising out of the love and the caring of all the participants. So everybody was a resource for everybody else. That was, that's my way of, of putting this experience into language. And since then, I've, I've called this uh, phenomenon the subtle commons. And once having experienced it, uh, it, it made it possible for me to tune into it again and to be aware of its presence. Now, for many years, for most of my life, really, I've been aware of the subtle environment around us. And I want to, I want to describe what for me is the difference between this experience of the commons and the experience of the subtle environment. Because the subtle environment is the, the etheric or the non-physical correspondence to our physical environment, at least up to a point. Uh, really, the subtle environment is, is, is like a radio dial in, or a television uh, uh, channels in that there are many frequencies, many levels of vibration that are contained within it. It's not simply one thing. So there are frequencies that are extremely close to the physical plane and that reflect, uh, at least where humanity is concerned, our thoughts and feelings fairly uh, accurately. At least uh, our thinking and our feeling can set this particular subtle frequency into vibration and motion. And then there are uh, frequencies that are a little bit re further removed, but which are accessible to various nature beings and, and David beings and other subtle entities that vibrates to their frequencies, to their activity. For me, the subtle environment is filled with fields of energy that are emanating from various beings on the one hand, or emanating from physical phenomena here in our world, in our incarnate world. So uh, I have before me my uh, glass of water and it has a, a field of energy around it. There's a field of energy that's emanating from the water itself. There's a field that's emanating from the glass. And though that field uh, extends into and becomes part of the subtle environment. Uh, my computer that here before me has its field. Uh, our house has its field and so on. So there's all these fields which can interact and overlap with each other. And through it all, there are flows of directed energy. So for example, if, if I think of uh, my, my son and daughter-in-law who just recently uh, gave birth to their first child and my first um, grandchild, then a flow of thought and, and of love goes out from me and it goes to them. And so that, that can be, if there's enough, if I put enough energy behind it, that can be an actual flow of directed etheric force that moves through the subtle environment. But there are other kinds of flows that are not so directed that just emanate from our activity or from our thoughts and feelings. I remember a very vivid 
experience of this a number of years ago when I went into a store to visit a friend of mine who was working there. And apparently she had not been having a very good day of it because when I came in and she was back in a corner of the store and she saw me and came over toward where I was standing. And all at once I could feel this like um, the little red hot like porcupine barbs uh, coming into my subtle body. And, and I'm not normally um, uh, clairvoyant at that level, at this etheric level, but in that moment I definitely was because as she came across the room, <clears throat> it was like she was surrounded with this red field of energy, which was shooting out these barbed quills. And I realized that she was angry. She, for whatever reason, she was really angry. And so I, I said, come on, let's go out and have a cup of coffee and you can take a break. And, and I wanted to get her out of the, out of the building because I could see that um, her coworkers were um, feeling the distress because they were being impacted, not just by you know, the outer manifestation of her anger, uh, and but by this inner uh, emanation of, of force uh, moving through the subtle environment. So I, I took her out and we calmed down and she calmed down and her, her art field uh, settled back into a more calm state. And, and then we went back into the, into the uh, store and one of her coworkers came up to me uh, in private and said, "Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you did that uh, because we were we were getting very distressed and weren't sure how to handle it." So there's those kind of flows, and there can be beneficent flows and not so beneficent flows of energy. But that, to me, is what the subtle environment, at least in that aspect of it, that's closest to the physical world is like. And, and these um, fields and flows, these, this whole energy network and energy activity that goes on um, connects us. Uh, we participate in it. And there's, there's exactly the same um, potential for utilizing this subtle environment and the energies within it to form positive and conscious connections between us. But they also form unconsciously. And they may, we may experience this as moments of telepathy, uh, when suddenly you know what somebody is thinking, or somebody says something that, that you were just thinking, or you may experience it as a kind of uh, tell emotion, you know, and not exactly a mental uh, transference of thought, but a transference of emotion in, in empathetic ways. So, uh, you know, none of us are, are contained, uh, really, in, in a bubble that shuts everything out and, and holds our own subjective world in secrecy. That uh, just like uh, uh, the president complains in the White House, there are lots of leaks. The information goes out and it vibrates through the subtle environment. I think of the subtle environment and indeed of the subtle worlds in general as being uh, a manifestation of Gaia's own subtle field. Excuse me a moment. I've got various things here to, to drink to keep my throat going. I've been having a bit of a problem with my voice lately. <clears throat> All right, so the subtle environment to me, and as well as the subtle worlds, is really part of Gaia's uh, planetary field. And so um, if the commons 
is is the a metabolic activity, the flow of of uh, metabolic energies like blood uh, within the body of Gaia. Then the subtle environment is more something that's held by Gaia as an environment in which things can happen for those who are incarnate within her field. Just the same way as the her physical body provides an environment for us to live out our incarnate lives and to experience all the richness and all the promise and all the beauty and all the challenges of uh, the material world. So one way I, th I think of this difference between the subtle environment and the commons is that the subtle environment deals with information of all kinds. This isn't always mental information. It can be emotional information. It can be energetic information. But it's, it's, it's creating and taking on some kind of form, whether it's mental or emotional, uh, etheric or otherwise. But the commons, the subtle commons deals with life. So I might think of this as um, as my my mental field and my emotional field are filled with my thoughts and feelings. But all of that is supported by my body's metabolism, which enables me to, in fact, have an incarnate physical mental field and emotional field in the first place. So, and I, I'm not saying that our consciousness is a product of our physical body, but part of our mental and emotional field of energy definitely is. And when the body dies, that those particular fields will dissipate, even though other aspects of ourselves move on into the subtle worlds. So I think of information as something that connects and it, uh, it, it enables uh, creation to take place. That is, it informs, it allows forms to manifest with purpose and with um, substance. But life holds and fosters that process. It provides a means of enabling that information to exist and to perform its task. Now, all of this is, is, is one person's experience of these domains. I want to be very clear on that, that what I'm sharing with you are my field notes. And someone else might easily experience this differently or might put it into different language. And I, I fully understand that. But what I want to portray is the, the distinction that I felt between this experience of the commons, which seemed to underlie the subtle environment and was not exactly part of it. And the energy flow and energy forms that exist in the subtle environment or in the etheric world, if you wish, that come into being and are enabled to exist and are held by the life that is supported and fostered by the commons. Now, we exist in both of these places and different parts of our whole self, our whole incarnate self responds to different frequencies, if you wish, or different elements of this subtle environment and the subtle commons. So where the subtle environment is concerned, where, where I first experience it, and I believe this is true for, for most people, 
is it, it, it directly impacts upon our own etheric or subtle body. And the nature of our subtle body is such that it, it participates in this, in, in this contact, in this engagement. It doesn't just, you know, register it the way my eyes register color or my ears register sound. But it participates in it to some extent. It becomes one with it. And if it's something that I want to become one with, like, uh, like I would like to share that sense of oneness with, with my garden, if I, if I work in a garden or with the, the, my friends or my lovers or my husband or wife or my children, then that, the subtle body will respond in a way that enhances that connection and allows a deeper blending to take place. If it's something I don't want to be connected with, then the subtle body can resist it and not take it on and push it out. Normally speaking, and here I'm speaking of a healthy, uh, naturally functioning uh, subtle energy field. So that's the first layer at which the subtle environment, the energies and, and fields around us impact us is, is in the subtle energy field that surrounds us, our subtle body, our etheric body. Then the second place that impacts us is through our psyche, that is our mind and our feelings. And here's where we can have a, an experience of telepathy or an experience of uh, a shared emotion, an empathetic resonance in which I suddenly know what someone else is feeling. And so information moving through the, the subtle environment, if it, if it has uh, been accepted, let's say, it's, it's um, it's come into a certain degree of resonance with our subtle body, then we become aware of it through our psyche, normally speaking, through our mind and our feelings and our emotions. But then there's the subtle commons, there's this deeper energy of life that's flowing in a way that nourishes the metabolism of Gaia. And this is something that we register in our body our, our body is perhaps the first to experience this. You know, uh, when it comes to sensitivity to the, to the non-physical realms, it is a paradox that the most sensitive part of ourselves is actually our physical body. And this is because it, it, it is attuned to these deep vibrations of life. Uh, it's attuned to uh, the world and to the wholeness of the world in ways that our, our minds and our feelings can separate from. Now, when we separate from this, when we create categories of thought and we and beliefs and attitudes and opinions that divorce us and separate us from the world around us, then we can, um, we can lose contact. We become unconscious to the sensitivity of the body, the way in which the body can actually uh, discern the, the subtle environment and even more deeply the subtle commons that it is part of. So I, in my own work, I look upon the body as a great ally. And if I want to do inner work, uh, the body is always where I start and then work out from there. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 
so the image here that I want to convey is that uh, we are this uh, tripartite entity, at least for purposes of this discussion. We're more complex than this, but I'm, I'm just keeping it simple in a, for, just for the purposes of this talk. A tripartite entity of a subtle body, uh, a psyche or a mental emotional field, and our physical body. And this whole system, this whole uh, combination, this combo of these three that make up our incarnate self is immersed in the sea of information and energy and life and, and spirit that is all around us. So how do we relate to that? How do we work with that? For me, the place where we start is what I call our sovereignty. And sovereignty is my word for that uh, direct connection between the incarnate self and the soul that is our origin. And the nature of this direct connection is that this is what instills agency in us. It's what enables us to choose and to create and to be generative out of our own unique person. And out of sovereignty, out of our sovereignty come our boundaries. Now, when I be began working with uh, colleagues in the subtle realms, I, I was 20 years old. I'd been aware of non-physical beings all my life. So working with them wasn't a new thing, but actually in entering into a partnership and, and beginning a, a definite um, project, a definite phase of work together, that was new. And the being that I had that initial relationship was, was a being who, whom I called John. One of the first things that he said to me as, as we began our partnership was, uh, David, you always have the right to say no to me. Whatever I may ask you to do or whatever I, whatever information I offer, you always have the right to say no to it, to, to question, to object, to, to say, well, I, I don't want to take that on or I don't want to do that. He said, if you can't say no, if we can't say no to each other. We can't say yes to each other. If you don't feel you have the right to say no to me, then you can't really say yes to me in a clear and positive way out of a, out of a freedom of heart and mind. There can't be any obligation. So this, this ability to say no has always been for me one of the, the first lessons and one of the first attributes we take on if we want to work with the subtle worlds. And there are some, some very good reasons for that, particularly in the subtle environment. There are, we run into these thought forms and, and actually very powerful, uh, very old or very, um, uh, what's the word I want, very highly structured patterns of thought and energy that have been created by people. And they may represent cultural ideas, they may represent institutions, they may represent uh, beliefs. And as I say, some of them are very ancient, they go back hundreds, if not thousands of years. And in a way, they are energetic habits 
that exist in the subtle environment, in the subtle world. And, and in some ways, they're neither bad nor good. It depends a bit on, on why they were created and, and how they were created. But they're, they're not thoughtful. They are habits. And if I encounter one of them, and we encounter them all, all the time in our lives, uh, in the form of cultural assumptions and habits and ways of doing things. If I encounter these, they're very powerful because they have a momentum of the momentum of habit behind them. And so if I if I don't feel I have the right to say no, if I can't put up a boundary there that uh, that gives me a breathing space and allows me to, to reflect and see, well, what do I think about this? What is my perception? What do I, how do I want to engage with this? Then we're just swept up into these energetic thought forms and we become uh, another way in which they embody themselves on the earth. Uh, these days, and uh, actually all around the world, there are rising protests against racism. And the Black Lives Matter movement is having a resurgence, which is wonderful. But racism itself, in in all of its forms, is is one of these highly powerful energetic thought forms, And it can manifest in various ways. Some are very overt and, and hurtful, but many are unconscious. And while not directly hurtful in the sense of uh, that we think of uh, a racist doing harm to somebody, but they, they destroy connections. They keep us apart. They hurt people in subtle ways, in, in small but cumulative ways. So if we're, if we're ever going to uh, get rid of racism in, in the world, then we have to say no to this energy in all of its various forms. And we have to, to look to see how, how has that particular thought energy become part of my life. And, and, and what can I do about that? And I can't do anything about it unless I can step away from it and say no to it so that I can say yes to something else. Yes to connection between myself and those of a different race, a different color, a different creed, a different nationality. For me, boundaries are not walls. They're not really intended to protect as much as they're intended to provide a meeting ground where my uniqueness can engage with your uniqueness. But in a way that our differences are protected. And here we, here we need to look at the idea of oneness. Because in some ways, oneness itself is one of these ancient thought forms that under certain circumstances we want to say yes to, and under other circumstances may, we may want to say no to. If in the way that I'm living out that thought, that energy, it leads me to destroy the differences between us the the uniqueness out of which creativity comes. If you and I all think alike, if you all say, David, I'm going to agree with everything you say, and I'm going to think exactly the way you do, and, and then we will be one together, um, this would not be a good thing. 
we would lose the richness of insight and wisdom and creativity that can emerge as we learn how to create a oneness through the connection of our differences. And sovereignty enables us to do that because sovereignty is respecting ourselves and boundaries enables us to do that because boundaries enable us to say no and to say yes and to take the responsibility for both. So my approach to the subtle environment and to the commons is to come, is to say, first, I will stand in my sovereignty. I will be aware of what my boundaries are. Where do I meet you? And how do I meet you? How do I meet what's happening in the subtle environment? And how do I meet the commons? And then I, I, then I get in touch with my body. You know, we began this, this um, talk with a meditation in which I asked you to be aware of and bless the place that you're in, because that's where your body is. And, and your body and the place that it's in always have a relationship together. They're exchanging energy all the time. I could just as easily have said, uh, pay attention to your body and, and appreciate and bless your body, which is a wonderful exercise all in itself. But the place that you're in is in a way a part of your incarnational body. I mean, it's, it's where you're expressing yourself. And if you weren't in that place, you'd be in a different place, but whatever place you're in, it provides you the opportunity to express and to be connected and to participate in the life of the world. Once I attune to my body, the body has a, uh, uh, it has a number of senses. We, we usually talk about the five senses, but there are at least nine. And I think actually, if I remember correctly, there's about 13 different physical senses that we have. And one of the senses we have is called um, proprioception. And it's the, it's the awareness of the body's position in space. It's how we know where our arms are and where our feet are and where our head is and so on. It's, it's our ability to map ourselves in space. And it's more than just that. Um, if, uh, if you're a tennis player and you go and you're playing tennis, the racket becomes part of you. And it's like the racket is an extension of your arm and your hand. And, and your body will map that. You can wield the tennis racket with skill because through this particular sense, it becomes part of the body. It is your body. Uh, when you're driving in a car and you become aware of where the edges of the car are, where the, the back bumper and the front bumper and the edges are, it's like your body map has expanded to fill this vehicle. So that's this particular sense. So my way of, of tuning into the, into the subtle is to go into my body, enter myself in my body, whatever, whatever that feels like for me, and usually that's tuning to roughly where my center of gravity is. Feeling comfortable and at home in my body. And then being aware of my body's position in space and how, how it is present to the space around it. 
to the room around it. And then I, I picture my subtle field like a bubble extending out around my body. And I extend that sense of body mapping into that, into that bubble, out into that field. Now I'm not just a physical body. My body map isn't just of my physical body. It's also of this bubble of subtle awareness and sensitivity. All the while holding to my sense of sovereignty and boundary. And it's a, in many ways, it's the same phenomenon as when I sit in a car and I'm driving and I feel the whole car as if it were my body, as if it were part of me. But now I'm feeling something invisible, something etheric as part of me. And then I, I put my attention into that expanded field. I, in the classes I teach, I call this particular exercise Soma to aura, the movement from the body out into one's auric field. And that, that works for me for getting in touch with the subtle environment. But if I want to be in touch with the, the subtle commons, I need to go deeper than that. And, and I need to go back into my body and into a sense of the presence of life. Because now what I want to tune into is not just the information, the psychic information or the subtle information or the subtle energy forms that are around me. I want to tune into the presence of life that is equally around me. And part of what takes me there is a willingness to be part of Gaia's life, to, to, to offer what I can to Gaia's metabolism, to be part of that commons, a resource. And what I am a resource for, what we are each a resource for, is that unique human lovingness that only we can bring and generate born out of our human experience, our human capacity to love and to bless. Which is very warm and rich and, and itself so often vibrant with a living energy. This is this this is the area of attunement where I feel most connected with people around me because it goes beyond uh, telepathy. It goes beyond just picking up others' thoughts or feelings. It even goes beyond feeling where we're all united in this field of, of Gaia, the field of life. And it goes into a feeling of, I'm a generative source and I, I offer what I have to you and I receive from you. And a sense of that flow of life moving between us, which is part of the greater flow of life that moves between us and the trees and us and the stones and the animals and the lakes and the air and the mountains and indeed the, the wholeness of Gaia's being. We live every day in the midst of community. At a everyday human level, in a, we are most aware of our separation and of the various things that arise that come between us. 
but that sense of a deeper communion of of the community of life the commons that we all are part of is always there it takes some practice to get used to it and to be able to touch into it but it is there and that i feel is the great blessing that we can bring to our world is is an awareness of this common that we share if there is one lesson that humanity is really struggling to get hold of and to deepen into and to embody it's this lesson of oneness through loving interconnection of being able to build communion and community together not just for humans, but for all life. I have no doubt that we will, in fact, arrive at that position, at that awareness. I don't know when we will, but I know we will become full citizens of the subtle commons. And everything we do today to build a sense of connection between us brings that day closer all right that that's what i want to say and um I, my voice is still more or less intact so i turn it over to you alexander thank you david and i suggest we have a minute of silence and hold what you share it in the group field. And then we will have about 15, 20 minutes to share our impressions, our thoughts, and maybe questions.
it's very special to sense our connectedness in this space that we create together in our circle. So I invite us to share now and please use the function, raise your hand and we will unmute you. And also you can share your thoughts in writing. Asia, please unmute yourself. Thank you, David, for that inspiring talk. The word that kept coming to mind was reciprocity. Our relationship to the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and Gaia in its fullness is reciprocal. And I think that's what we're being asked to remember is that Gaia is waiting for us to nurture this garden, to tend for, tend to all the aspects of this place that we share so that we become more mindful when we run the tap and have the gift of fresh water coming into our homes, that we're mindful of what we put back into the earth. Um, really an invitation to tend our garden, our portion of this garden that we all share with insight and joyous caring and mindfulness. So thank you so much for this beautiful energy that we are part of, that we've created together. And that energy will continue to inspire us as we tend to the subtle commons. So great gratitude. Thank you. And thank you very much for, <clears throat> excuse me, the the concept of reciprocity because that really captures it in a single word very nicely so thank you i i appreciate that pleasure margo are you unmuted yes thank you Thank you, Alexander, and thank you, David and Daisha. They're just bathed in this beautiful, beautiful energy. While my mind is still not totally wrapped around the whole, well, the idea of, of a subtle commons, yes, I can sense the subtle commons. I don't necessarily understand it yet. And I realize that it isn't necessary to understand it as long as that, the sensing and that reciprocal action is, is living, is being lived and loved. Uh, thank you, Margot. You know, <clears throat> I can appreciate that. Um, and the, the, the last thing that I want to do is to uh, generate more jargon, because we've got a lot of it already in the esoteric fields. Um, but what I wanted to do was to convey the the experience, the experience that I had that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk was very powerful. And it's, of course, it's always hard to, to convey uh, 
an experience. You know, it's one of those things where you say, well, you had to have been there. But but the thing that stood out for me in, in the experience, which my um, this nature being um, in, induced was the um, was the way well it was really the, the the reciprocity the way in which um, I could feel all these all these lives that made up the inner ecology in and around uh, here where I live I mean in that sense it was very specific it's something that was tied into this area I could feel all these lives each one of them acting as a conduit for the the for the life of for life to flow uh, into this shared resource into this shared common just like it's like this pool of life that everybody was contributing to and everybody was taking from and rather than saying well this life is coming from this specific source it uh, it was really coming from the united uh, contributions of these various beings, great and small, creating this, uh, this kind of moving pool of light and life that then they could, everyone could also draw from. So it was that sense of both contributing to and receiving from and, and acting to nourish the whole uh, that made me think of the of it as a commons, and so that's the that is the word that best summed it up for me. Yes, thank you. And and the beauty revealed and lived as you're speaking. Desha and I are just across the Salish Sea from you on in Victoria. Aha, yes, yes, you're <clears throat> we're practically na <clears throat> practically neighbors. Yes, we are. <laughs> I want to to, to add uh, to what you sh uh, shared, David, uh, in terms of creating the new esoteric jargon. I think it's uh, in in a way it's an aspect of uh, getting into the essence of any concept that we operate with and that we share uh, and uh, the same way as recognizing subtle realms and connecting on the essential level of this existential essential level if we connect with those concepts and come up with our own words i don't see it as creating the new jargon it's finding the the new aspect that communicates about that essential thing originally when we uh in the 2025 initiative group we were uh coming up with the topics for each full moon for this we the the topic that came to us it was etheric leaven living and telepathic communication and uh when we invited david to talk about it david said but i don't have uh, my direct experience on telepathic communications but the way how you presented this idea of what is telepathic communication expressing as subtle commons i think it speaks much more than the term telepathy and because the way how telepathy presented in uh alice bailey's writings is that it's everything is energy and everything connected to, through this subtle realm and that uh, our understanding of telepathy is just as a mental uh, communication uh, is very limiting in reality it's exactly what you've been talking today so uh, really appreciate the way how you expressed it so i don't think we should be afraid of that Creating more jargon. It's not jargon. It's <laughs> thank you, Alex I'll, thank you, Alexander. I, I'll stop uh, lying awake at night <laughs> uh, trembling. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, it really what it really comes down to for me is because I like to play with words, uh, 
Um, but I do it because uh, I want to, to try to help people get to just what you said, the existential experience. What's the essence of the experience? And sometimes words, words can help reveal that and sometimes they can get in the way particularly if they're words that we're very familiar with. And, you know, when you asked me if I would speak about telepathy, uh, telepathy is one of those words for me that has a very specific meaning of the mental transference of thought. <laughs> um, and I recognize that, that, that what uh, DK uh, has, to, has to say about it, and what you've just said about it, it's much, much more than that. But you say you say potato, and I hear potato. You know, you say telepathy in this broad exchange of energy, and I hear telepathy as uh, the projection of one person's thoughts into the mind of another. And and so that you know that's my challenge because that's a way in which that word uh, hangs me up on. In a in a more uh, um, constricted definition than what you have in mind. So, so yeah. So you know, I it I'm not afraid of creating jargon. I just get afraid when um, something gets used so much that we lose it loses its power to take us into the essence, and and we hear it and we think, oh, I know what that means because we've heard it so many times, but in fact, the experience is always new and and we really don't know what it means <laughs> because it's constantly unfolding itself. Anyway, I appreciate what you said, Alexander. Thank you very much. There are a few more comments uh, been shared uh, on the, um, in writing. Uh, I will uh, read them. Uh, there okay. also was, uh, Ray, uh, Annette, your hand was uh, raised, but not anymore. If you still would like to share, please raise your hand again. And I will read a comment from Marta. David, okay. thank you exceedingly for this talk. You brought into the light a quality of connection that I had no words for before. The new thought you offered to me was how this energy field that is channeled through our love for one another has also to do with this subtle energy needing us as well to augment their lives. Could you talk a bit more about their need for us? A kind of sacred reciprocity. Um, <clears throat> talk a bit more about the need for that. I will report now the comment. Uh, unfortunately, the control, this platform has limitations in terms of sharing comments, so I had to repost in the chat. So you can now see um, in the chats. Oh, okay, yeah, the, I, I've got it here. Let me just take a look. Ah, okay. Um, so this is an area that I'm exploring and, and learning about as well. Um, so I'm just, I'm just uh, thinking of the, of the words that I want to express this. Um, so it, it comes it, it comes back to me to this idea of Gaia's metabolism. And again, I'm using a a biological metaphor, but yet it's still it's that which keeps Gaia alive and functioning in a way. It's that which which is the circulation of living energy that allows Gaia to manifest, certainly at, at this level of being. And um there are many ways in which we generate energy you know, through our thinking and through our feeling, through our activity that that doesn't directly deal with that. It doesn't um, it doesn't enhance Gaia's life in that way. 
of enabling it to, to be able to manifest at this level of being. It doesn't necessarily detract from it. I'm not saying, you know, it, it's just neutral. It doesn't, um, it's like we're not plugging into the bloodstream, but we're doing something else that may be equally important and vital. I mean, in one way, uh, if I, if I uh, switch the metaphor entirely and, and think of a theater, uh, if I run a theater and then I provide a stage in which the actors can come and a playwright can come and present a story that the audience uh, enjoys and the actors, once they're done, they leave, the playwright goes, but the theater is still here. And so the theater needs a staff. It needs people who are dedicated to keeping the theater itself in existence. And obviously, when actors and actresses come and a play is put on, that brings in revenue and that helps keep the theater in existence. I mean, the theater doesn't exist for its own sake. It exists as a platform through which these uh, performances can take place. So there's reciprocity there. But the actors and actresses are not necessarily directly in, involved in uh, helping me run the theater or repairing the faucet and the, the sinks in the bathroom or fixing the chairs if they got broken or re fixing a hole in the roof and things like that. So we have this, we have this interesting dual role and I, I, um, many being do. Uh, in my experience, there are, there's, a, there's a class of, of inner beings that I call uh, the Gaian metabolism beings, <laughs> because the way in which I experience them and how they present themselves to me is that, is that they're the staff that keeps the world going and keeps all this life uh, available for all of us. But then there are beings that are here like actors and not just physical beings, not just us, but but there are subtle beings and other forms of life that use and use Gaia gratefully uh, as an environment in which to work out their evolutionary drama or work out whatever the whatever their uh, play may be, whatever their script may be. And they're not involved with actually maintaining the well-being of Gaia itself in, in terms of keeping the theater uh, in good repair. So what I felt I was touching into with the comment was the place where uh, instead of having a theater management that runs the theater and takes care of it, and then the play, uh, the actors and playwrights that use the theater to put on their dramas, Instead, it was like having a community theater in which the actors and actresses are also the staff of the of the theater and vice versa. So I might have a role of uh, repairing uh, the toilets in the bathroom and then uh, playing Othello on the stage. So um, so we're, the theater becomes a resource, a commons that we're all benefiting from and we're all taking care of. And there was a sense of, of, um, of an invitation really to human beings to learn how to become part of that, to not just be performers who are, in Shakespeare's words, strutting our stuff upon the stage, but we become part of the community theater and take on some of the of the well-being of of the of of Gaia's life as well. And in so doing, our life is enriched because it's a it's a reciprocal process. Um, this is something I'm still exploring, Alexander and everybody, uh, because there are, there are many human beings. I feel who are here to work out their incarnational and evolutionary arcs and dramas. But there are increasingly, uh, I feel, 
uh, members of the human race who recognize that our next step is to learn how to participate in community theater and not simply be a roving band of artists that go from stage to stage and city to city, but to learn what it means to actually uh, create and maintain the theater as well as creating and maintaining the art and the drama and the music and so on. I'm not sure this is answering your question, actually, for which I apologize, but um, but it's what your question brings up for me. And it's, it's this ability to um, say, I'm part of the community theater. I'm part of what keeps this world alive on many levels, not just, not just uh, the outer environmental level and climate change and all of that, but inwardly in terms of, of contributing a loving energy to the, to the whole process that, that is embracing all of life and nourishing all of life. Um, and that is what I think of as, as, as what we're learning in terms of sacred reciprocity. Thank you, David. There are many more uh, questions and comments that were shared in, in writing, and I reposted them in the chat. Unfortunately, we don't have much uh, time left to uh, go through those. Uh, we can just look through them and absorb them into our group field. But as we come to the end of the webinar, I suggest we have another um, period of silence to together bring upwards into the group focus the concept and the topic of this group uh, collective theater, as you said, and finding our role in that and recognizing subtle comments and truly indeed intending taking intent holding intention as a group that this would become reality for humanity in the due course in the due time thank you david thank you everybody thank you alexander it's been a, a privilege and a pleasure to be with you all today. So let's have now a couple minutes of silence holding this topic in our collective group focused intention and consciousness.
and to empower our group intention. Let's sound together the great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center, which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Thank you. And we invite you to join our coming webinars. On the screen, you see the list of the planned webinars, and we continue our daily meditative vigil at 8, 8 p.m. GMT, focusing on the collective shift to the soul consciousness in humanity. Please join that. You can see the registration link for the Cancer Leo Cycle daily meditation in your chat window. At the coming new moon cycle, tentatively on July 21st, uh, we will have our last webinar in the third cycle of the meditation focusing on the united nations sustainable development goals this time we focus on the goal three health and well-being please bring your focus if in your daily meditation on strengthening the thought forms of the sustainable goal number three and on August 2nd, we invite you to join our Leo Solar Festival webinar, focusing on restoration of ancient mysteries and the power of rituals. Together with Zahra Indigaronlov, who will take us on a journey into the be land, be or not to be, connecting our higher minds. And we invite you and remind you about the call for offering your creative labs where you or your group or together, you could offer to the community the creative lab focusing on any topic of your interest that you can take responsibility to invite others continue in our collective journey. And currently in the, we have two creative labs that have 
preparing a, and the information about those will be shared uh, in the next few uh, days or weeks. Thank you a lot. Much love and appreciation.